Hello and welcome to the second entry of the Pivotal Work Early Access Series hosted by the Oklahoma Film and Music Office. This is a preview to the 2021 Film and Music Conference and this panel discussion is called Music Pros in Oklahoma, Putting Your Creativity to Work. And it features a discussion between professionals in, key, in three key areas of the music industry. We've got professionals from what I'm calling a subcategory of sectors. We've broken out the business sector, the performance sector and production in Oklahoma and talent across the state. And we will highlight the different career paths that these individuals have taken to get them to where they are today. Why I'm here, my name is Crystal Yosef. I am the owner of a marketing and PR firm called Conjo Concepts based in Oklahoma City. I've worked with music and talent across the state for the past three years in my business since I started it in January, 2018. Um, and I am joined today by three professionals um, that I'm looking forward to the conversation. We'll have Graham Colton will join us a little bit later in the conversation. Um, but today we also have Allie Harder and Dustin Howard. Allie is representing the musician side of the conversation today and Dustin is on the production side. Um, interestingly, I know that they both have different talents that kind of interweave within these categories, but they're here to speak to those particular subsections today. And I'll let Allie introduce herself and Dustin can do the same. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, my name is Ali Harder. Uh, I'm a musician from Oklahoma. I've claimed different parts of Oklahoma, just depending on where I'm at at the time, but Oklahoma City proper for the most part. I've been playing music. My bio says for about 15 years, but it's probably realistically um, closer to t 20 here and there, uh, playing full time or doing stuff behind the scenes. Um, I take a little bit of a break from music recently and I just released a new record in June promoting that and have some randomly some new music coming out this winter that I didn't necessarily anticipate but so I'm still kind of banging away at it. Okay I think we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Yeah. But Dustin. Uh, yeah my name is Dustin Howard. Um, grateful to be here. I reside in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I guess I'm a film composer now. I've moved into that for the past several years. Uh, we were talking a little bit before I've played music my whole life, you know, and my personal story arc involves kind of realizing the world does not need another rock band. And what do I do with the skill set that I've acquired? How do I, how do I, uh, you know, bring it, bring it to life, the vision, whatever it is that you want to do, it can be done, but there's not a blueprint. Especially not in a year like the one we're in today. Especially huh? not. Yeah. yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> our masks aren't under our chair. <laughs> so, Ali, I guess to the performance side, I know, um, you know, we'll start with, I know you, Woody Guthrie Award winner for Best Singer Songwriter, and you shared the stage with national and local acts throughout the state and recorded original music and you've dabbled in commercial work. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what that looks like, what that's looked like for you in Oklahoma and how Oklahoma has been part of that conversation? I mean, Oklahoma has always been the this, this central theme of that conversation. I think that's one thing that um, I'm very proud of mm -hmm. is staying here and sticking it out. I think all of my my support, um, my resources are here, staying true to the city and staying true to the uh, recording studios, to the radio stations, um, to before I could do it myself, the graphic designers, all of these different people that, you know, become part of your world as a musician are, uh, for me personally, have always been based in Oklahoma. That's something that I've always, I've been very, very proud of. And it's never really been a second thought. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for the most part, and I don't feel myself <laughs> changing, you know, changing my mindset on that. Um, Oklahoma, it's just, it's been everything, everything. And so, Dustin, you're a little bit further north, green country from Tulsa, self-taught musician um, and a citizen of Cherokee Nation. Yes. So yeah. maybe tell us a little bit about the Tulsa aspect and your work there. I know <clears throat> Tulsa has been on the map, if you will, a little bit longer than Oklahoma City. Sure. Um, uh, so talk us through that. Yeah, Tulsa is a very unique city. Um, people try to compare it to Austin a lot mm -hmm. of times because it's weird. I, I, I wouldn't go that far. I would, I would, the amount of talent, the amount of, um, you know, just opportunity in Tulsa, Oklahoma is overwhelming. And, um, you know, whether, whether you want to play at it, at, at, like in a, a bar, mm -hmm. you know, like for the sound pony or whether you want to, you know, make it to the stage of the canes, it's, it's accessible. It's, it's hard. I, I think to try to know what to do, what is the next right thing to do? My, you know, my story arc just is, it involves just getting involved. 
you know, if you want to start a band, if you want to build a network, the, the talents there, the people are there. I'm constantly blown away by what's happening in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's awesome. And I know you've transitioned away from live performance um, over into musician, and musician composition and recording. Um, how does that work for you throughout the state and being, you know, being here in the state and kind of getting that arc out going? Yeah, um, whenever I was playing music and touring, I, you know, I, I made a lot of contacts. Um, some of that's been fruitful. Some of it is just, again, building a network. Um, I guess the question is, how am I staying relevant or moving into, a, you know, um, let's say, let's say the production professional, what, what do you want to do? You want to start recording? Um, well, that can be a daunting task at first. You might feel intimidated. Uh, Logic Pro X would be, you know, one way to get started. Reaper would be another way to get started. You just have to get busy. You know, you can teach yourself how to change an alternator on YouTube and you can teach yourself how to record on YouTube. You know, mm -hmm. you might not find the best information, but there is, you know, if you don't have access to being able to attend a university for something like that, my suggestion to anybody who wants to get involved is just to get involved. Start with a single microphone. Um, if you can answer what a compressor is, you're on the right track because a lot of times you get involved in that, that conversation and people seem like they're speaking over your head and you might feel embarrassed, you know, not my, my story arc involves seeking out mentorship. I would find a person who was recording music that I was interested in and I would say, could I maybe come hang out and work for free? You know, I can run the mic cables. I can ask the questions. What can I, what can I learn as opposed to what do I bring to the table is more or less, you know, we'll get that at first to get involved. Who can I learn from? Who, who knows what to do, how to do what I want to do was how, how I got involved in it. And we'll talk a little bit more about social media and maybe how you can find those people a little bit further along. Um, so just throughout the state, like doubling down in Oklahoma a little bit more, just like higher level. Um, you know, I think we've leveled up um, as far as venues go, especially in Oklahoma City, we've had a ton relatively, uh, if you want to say that, of venues pop a up. A bunch and, of our old ones being rebuilt. Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah, so it's pretty cool. And then, you know, like, they, so thinking through these new venues that have come up and these new opportunities, um, there's more opportunity for work and workforce development, and we'll keep talking about that. Um, ACM at UCO is also a school here in Oklahoma City where that workforce development aspect is really kind of picked up. Um, but specific to the two of you and the ways you've contributed here in Oklahoma um, with your design shop, and then I know you do music composition for video games and the fact that that industry is alive and well here and that you're a part of that. I'd like to start with your design work um, and just tell us a little bit about Pig's Fly Shop and how your experience as a music on the, on the musician side of this music industry, um, how has that allowed you to open up space in your mind creativity, creatively to help musicians with design work? I will say it ties in to what you were saying about um, just get out there and do it. And if you can answer what a compressor is, then you're on the right track. And you named a lot of design programs. And I think, you know, alternatively on the design side of things, it's the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think I started, you know, a million billion years ago, like, you know, wanting to be taken seriously. So I'm gonna have a show poster. I'm gonna make an 11 by 17. I'm gonna learn how to do that. I'm gonna slap it on the outside of the conservatory and I'm gonna be taken seriously. Those posters were made with like Windows Paint, right. you know what I mean? And and then you work your way up. Um, for for me, and I think what you're talking about is just start, mm -hmm. is just start, and don't ever you know say no to a challenge. If this is to be a learning experience, I do want to emphasize that. Don't ever say no to the challenge, and just get in there and do it. And also, when you were, I, I do want to add on to whenever you were saying, uh, go find a mentor. You are young and you are new, and finding a mentor is important but you are allowed to be snobby with your mentor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it does not fit, it does not fit and it will not work. <laughs> so I wanted to, to tag that. But as far as like me, uh, what I do now, it definitely started with me at the very beginning. There was a necessity, there was a need that I had to fulfill in order to do my job. Um, and so I just started doing it because I couldn't afford as a beginning musician right. to pay somebody. Right. And so you learn how to do it and that snowballs and the further you go the further you go the bigger shows you get uh if you are an artist in your head uh out you know a musician and i went to college to be a graphic designer and i dropped out to tour and play music okay so that's part of my background um i got better and better and better and then especially this year 
when shows dropped off and we couldn't play anymore, thank God I learned how to, you know, do mm -hmm. posters because that's sustained my family. But mm -hmm. um, every, every other skill, Pig's Fly Shop came definitely from all the skills that I have acquired along the way, being a baby musician, a struggling musician, then getting a little bit of notoriety and then having, having to, to put myself out there as a professional, you have to find ways um, to be perceived the way that you want to be. And then Pig's Fly Shop kind of came along and utilized all of those skills. Okay. And same question to you if you remember it, but yeah, just could... your contributions um, to the industry and, and what that looks like. Um, could you repeat the question again? Yeah, so answer. I know we've kind of der <laughs> derived a little bit um, from that, so we've kind of stepped away from it a little bit, but um, any work that you're doing now or personal stake that you have in businesses here in Oklahoma, like how you're working um, within the industry throughout the state with your particular businesses that you so, run? Yeah, you had mentioned um, <clears throat> you know, video games and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Th these people are accessible. They're, it's a person. It's like, you know, I was a guy driving a car earlier and you know now I'm sitting here and being a professional. Well, the same same thing applies to to a person who's maybe an independent video game film, you know, film composer. Just reach out to them. But you know, my, the first thing I, I guess I would say is get prepared. You know, um, spend the two hundred dollars that to build your website or build a place on the internet that you exist and you can you know promote yourself. So that that would be my my first advice of how to stay relevant during this time period is you know get your ducks in a row. Um, if if you're a guy on SoundCloud or a girl on SoundCloud, that's great. But there are you are a seashell and a sea of shells. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a way, like in you know in, in my my experience was building a website. You know, and, and well, what is it yet? Well, I don't I don't I don't really know at the time when I'm building it because I don't know if I only want to do video game music. I don't know if I want to try to take on huge cinematic landscapes or if I just want to create music for an app, you know, um, but now I have a place where I can send a person and say, well, this is what I'm doing and what it's going to evolve into. I couldn't tell you. Right. I, re yeah. I really couldn't, you know, like you're talking about. That's exactly what Pigs Fly Shop was, because at the beginning of it, it was pigs can fly. It can be anything. Mm -hmm. right. And there was literally like 17 different things that I was. But I bought up all the web real estate that said Pigs Fly Shop on it. And now it's mine. And now I know what it is. Right. So that's a good. Yeah, definitely a wonderful place. To start. I, I didn't. I truthfully did not know what I was doing whenever I, you know, I, I moved. I transitioned away from live performance. And I, and I still do that for my own reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, I enjoy I enjoy doing that and I'm not going to stop doing that. But it, when it comes to monetizing music or or something that, you know, gets a little bit more realistic as you move away from your 20s, 30s. And how, how, do, how do you stay, how do you continue to do this? Because at some point in time, there is a financial motive that could either, that can, that could literally destroy your, your love for, for making music. And so for, in, in my, in my experience, it involved, you know, a, you're, I'm watching a movie and I say, well, I could do that, you know? So try, you know, you, there's nothing that says you can't, download a Hans Zimmer song and try to make another one that's your own version. And I don't mean plagiarism. I mean, like, right. let's let's try to write something. Inspiration. In, inspiration, right. And so let's go back um, a little bit. I know we talked about new venues and sort of the new work that you're doing. What are some of your favorite Oklahoma hidden music with storylines, like some treasure, um, whether it's Black Watch Studios or Guest Room Records, something that's a little bit nostalgic or has a little bit of an emotional appeal to it. Um, Guitar House of Tulsa, if there's any stories or connections you have that take people back a little bit. Okay. Um, Tulsa, Oklahoma's music scene is is wild. Uh, you know, Sound Pony Bar would be a, a really, mm -hmm. really interesting place to reference. That's like a safe haven for, and, and I mean this with nothing but affection, but you know, the weirdos and, and the, the people who you probably want to spend time with. Right, yeah. Um, the so, weirdos, they're like the only ones that would book me for a minute. <laughs> now wait a minute. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so that would be the first thing that comes to my mind would be uh, as far as like hidden gems. Um, I think as far as in Oklahoma City, my hidden gems, I mean, they're not necessarily hidden because they're, you know, advertised like crazy. And um, one of my favorites, it started off as a JJ's, I'm not sure which one came first, but JJ's Saloon was where a lot of us would go on mm -hmm. our Sundays and just blow a gasket and we'd play for 10 or 12 hours yeah. and people would come down from Tulsa and people would come from out of state and we would play on that stage. And it was, you know, the blues, uh, there was the blue saloon and, you know, many other forms before that, before uh, Jeff Rogers and his crew got a hold of it. Um, but that is, you know, since closed and now it's JJ's Alley downtown. And on Sunday, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you can see 8 million different performers and touring bands that come through after they played, well, you know, 
rest in peace, Wormy Dog, but you know, they'd play right. their Saturday night and then those musicians would show up Sunday morning mm -hmm. and play. And there's about, you know, 8,000 of us that have this tattoo, okay. the Seventh Day Rebellion tattoo from JJ's. And I, I can't even, Blank Lankford, Blake Lankford has a, run that for a million years. That's one of my favorites. If you want to find um, some good music from kids that go to ACM, I, I don't mean to, kids always sounds derogatory to me, like when somebody calls me honey or ma'am. Um, but from the students that go to ACM right down the street, mm -hmm. they'll show up and play in there. Kids, talent that we've never heard before. People from out of state, touring bands that come in on their day off. If you want to find um, some music that you've never heard before, I would highly recommend going to, you know, JJ's on a Sunday. That's my number, my number one. Um, and there's, and is there's, that pretty easy, ex easily accessible for students to just reach out and... Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you look up the Seventh Day Rebellion or JJ's Alley or Blank Langford on all of your favorite social media platforms, uh, you'll find a way to get a hold of them. And it's easy, okay. easy as shooting a Facebook message. Mm -hmm. and be like, hey, man, I want to play it. I'll be there at blah, blah, o'clock. Exactly. Or, you know what? If You know what? Show up. Show up. With we'll the guitar. In. They'll get you yeah. in. Yeah. Every single time. And he has, like... <laughs> Jeff, the owner of that bar, has built in racks, like mm -hmm. when they redid the upstairs and the outside racks, to house, you know, dozens of guitars at a time because that's the point, um, you know, to get everybody involved and make it accessible. I've gotten for lost everybody. there on a Sunday night for hours, <laughs> and I'm like, I need to get out of here. But it's, everybody's so good, it's and like, fun. you know, they're yeah. always surprises. They're always pulling somebody back up from the back, and, and it's hilarious. They just so happen to have brought their guitar, yeah. and then they're hopping on stage or they're sharing guitars. We spend so, yeah, holidays cool. there and anniversaries yeah. and weddings and I don't know turns turns into like open mic like comedy stand-up slam I mean it's you know the fun is it's, it's wonderful I love it well we talked a little bit about social media so um, and I know social media can be a four-letter word at times maybe for musicians with promoting yourself I know that can be a little difficult but if you had a preference of um, platforms is it LinkedIn is it Instagram is it Twitter is it something we don't know about that's maybe not mainstream, but there's some underground forum that, you know, kids need to watch? Like in my business, I set Google alerts um, and just kind of like watch the industry that way. And so if I get a ping for, I have like weird keywords in there. If I get a ping, then I kind of read stories just in my free time whenever I carve that out um, just for like some continuing education type stuff. But is there anything forums or social media, traditional social media that you would recommend? Uh, as you transition to the professional side of it, my real advice would be to delete your personal Facebook um, because people cannot distinguish between you being a person and you being a, you know, conglomerate or, or mm -hmm. however it is. So if I'm Dustin Edward Howard, the composer, which I am, they will find your personal Facebook. So I would say try to stay away from Facebook when it comes to the professional side of it. Um, you know, if I had to choose one, Instagram and Reddit. That's but that's just my taste. Mm -hmm. You know, I. I see the younger younger crowd and they're going viral on TikTok and you know and I'm like well, I just don't know if I have the energy to to do the next thing to do the next social right. media thing personally that's that's just been my experience. It's it's funny that you say that because I think my answer would be almost the exact opposite. Just just because of the genre that I typically play in and the the, the you know the people that I typically run around with um, I have played with you know everybody in the state, all different genres, and I love that. I want to be able to play every single kind of music, and I want everybody you know, uh, you know, hip hop to country to you know the indie kids to all be on a bill together, mm -hmm. is what I love. Um, but I cut my teeth in country music and folk music, and I do think that being accessible and real to those people is very important. Um, my personal Facebook was there before mm -hmm. Facebook pages was ever a thing. And so I've slowly, <laughs> especially in this election year, have slowly been kind of cleaning out my personal page right. and putting everything on my yep. business page. But I tell you what, as far as for me, as far as um, advertising myself, a lot of those people I mean, they want to know what's going on in our life. We, they want us, they want, they don't want to feel like, you know, we're just, we're behind, mm -hmm. you know, a wall or something. They want to know what we're really about. And I think these days being authentic and people being able to support you because of who you actually are is very important. And so that's why I do keep my, my personal Facebook. I have got a business page for every single one of my businesses, all the nonprofits that I run. Um, I don't think that Facebook is the platform for business no. at all whatsoever you will get 
you will get you know a fraction of the likes or the interest that you uh, would on any other platform. Pictures, Instagram, people want to mm-hmm. see what's going on. They want to see what you're doing. TikTok is hilarious. If you've got a sense of humor, especially this year, right? If you've got a sense of humor, get on the TikToker. And you, ha- I mean, I, I feel like you have. I, I don't have the energy for it either. Yeah, but well, yeah, I bet. But it, you know, it's kind of I don't know. It's kind of fun sometimes, but you kind of have to if you want to keep the the people that are coming up behind you interested. And the last thing that I'll say about that is no matter what platform you're on, because there was a million that I started on that I got fantastic opportunities from. Do you guys remember Pure Volume? Oh yeah. You remember that? Do you know? See, Mm -hmm. it depends on what generation you are from. Pure Volume is how I got, I started touring in France. Okay. Mm. Because they found me on that. It's not even a platform anymore. Mm -hmm. I would say get on every single platform that you can. Uh, Is there anything like that that exists now? Well, I mean, you know, you've got I mean, your. We don't have MySpace anymore, right? So that right. was like a thing. But uh, then I found my MySpace page. It's not. It's a different thing. Just kind of keep up with the platforms that are coming out mm-hmm. and what are hot. But the main thing would be whichever platform you pick, uh, whether it's a shot in the dark, it's a new platform or not. Answer people. Mm-hmm. Right. Answer their messages. Leave comments. Engage. Yeah. Engage. 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 It doesn't matter what you're on. Just engage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And be authentic about it. If, right? if there actually, I would like to make it adamantum to my to my answer. Um, Distro Kid is is like oh, yeah. is a, is a good is a good way to handle all of that at once because what she's saying is very true. Mm-hmm. You can't really exist in a world that does not you know social media. You can't just like not do it. And I, for me, my experience has been trying to figure out what is the what is real progress and what is the illusion of progress. So congratulations, you have ten thousand likes on <laughs> Facebook, but mm-hmm. that literally means nothing. Right. And why you know are you going to use all your energy on social media? But again, you can't pretend it's not a real thing. It's a very, very valuable tool and asset. How do you manage it? I have done it through something like DistroKid, mm-hmm. which allows me to just immediately use Oh, it. this is a whole other conversation of yeah. like the integrations and websites. And it is a whole nother job. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's um, a lot. But the ways that you can kind of, you know, get it, make it manageable. And that's, I heard about DistroKid doing some work um, with some professors at ACM. Mm-hmm. So they've got obviously classes that teach uh, marketing for music and that's where I learned about it. And so I think the kids these days, if you will, you know, they're coming up and learning that if they're lucky enough to go to school at something at, you know, an establishment like ACM because they're teaching them these things that are developing in real time. Um, things that maybe we aren't really familiar with or if we're tuning out or back from social media a little bit, they're learning all these things in the classroom, which is really cool. So sure. there is hope for that next wave. Well, they're that also next wave utilizing it like for, for pleasure and for business, <laughs> mm-hmm. whereas like we as older adults are like just in the muck of the politics. Yeah. So when we take a step back from social media, it's a little bit of a different... Just open it up to clear my notifications <laughs> yeah, and I'm back I'd, up. I'd, <laughs> I'd turn mine off. For I, I turned off my personal Facebook yeah. off for the past like few months for obvious reasons. Yeah. Well, I like workforce development a lot in many industries that I work within, but then for music, um, and my only example was what I called like a sandwich mayo spreader. So like, tell me a position that you've encountered on the music side and then also on the production side where you're like, man, if we did not have this person running coffee or they like they sustained me, I mean, obviously looking for like a title position, but um, what's like just, I mean, and we can speak to like the breadth of positions that are out there that maybe, you know, not everybody can be headlining um, a bill and not everybody can be the many titles that you have under your belt on the, on the um, composition side. But what are some of those things, some of those positions that kind of, you know, sustain you and fulfill you? And you're like, I could not do this if it weren't for tech number one on mm-hmm. the soundboard. If, if I had to make up a title, it's it's a role that whenever I was speaking about mentorship, it's the same role I played mm-hmm. whenever I'm, you know, uh, reaching out to so and so who owns this studio and say, hey, can I can I come run cables? Well, now I need that guy or that that right. person. You know, um, if I'm having to mix and master, let's say a, a drum set in a day, just the the act of getting up and leaving my workstation to go adjust a microphone mm-hmm. is all it takes for you to become distracted. So if you have, in, in in my experience, if I'm recording in an analog setting, I absolutely have to have a person in, who the title. I I I mean, it, you could call him a gopher okay. or you know something like that. That's that's what my experience is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think I would have to kind of agree with that. And it, it is difficult to give them an absolute title because 
um, whether you're in the studio, like as a you know, performing musician, if you're in the studio or if you're at a venue or if you're at something like this, um, I would say the person that we cannot get along with is the person in the room who is working the hardest, who is the hungriest, who is not necessarily the highest on the food chain. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times in the bar, that's gonna be you know, the backup sound man that's running cables or it's gonna be the bar back in the studio, it's gonna be the intern. Uh, you know, in a place like this, it could be, you know, the guy at the door that's like, well, here's this, here's this, here's this, here's this, this is where you go, da, da, da. I mean, we, I walked in the door and I was like, oh, what am I doing? Yeah. And there was a gentleman at the front door that was like this, 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 this and got me back here like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think um, there's not an official title for it. I think it's just... Um, because all of us at the beginning of our careers will be that person. Yes. It's yeah, the, hungry, the, hungriest pers the hungriest person mm -hmm. in the room. That, that's exactly it. That I was that person for a, little, a long time, and, and now I have that person working mm -hmm. for me. And if, if I'm providing the, the opportunity, then that person will create the next chain of events right. that will allow the- Treat them with respect. Y yeah. So absolutely. they don't they don't become the highest person on the food chain and turn into a- mm -hmm. That guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or girl. Or girl. <laughs> or girl. So let's time travel a little bit um, and imagine that it's 2030. It's scary. Um, and you have a magic wand that you can swipe. What is the state of the industry here in Oklahoma, the music industry in Oklahoma? What does that look like? Oh, um, well, I think we have everything in place um, as far as you know, venues that are, have been started, larger, large scale venues, uh, venues being rebuilt. Um, we've got a lot of restaurants coming in, tourism, uh, a lot of uh, interest from the arts community mm -hmm. itself. Um, the one thing that I think we've all discussed being musicians, uh, venue owners, restaurant owners, uh, people in studios that we wish would maybe happen sooner than later and this is something that we've been battling for so long in Oklahoma City and Tulsa too is public interest mm -hmm. I don't know what that is mm -hmm. um, there's so much talent here and there's so many people working their tails off I mean fighting uh, I mean and I feel like maybe they shouldn't have to fight as hard because they're very very talented I wish that there was a way to engage just the public and the arts community a little bit more. So to me in 3030, there would be some, you know, some magic wand that went, Whew, you all care, mm -hmm. you know, to support these venues and, you know, everything that's coming here so they can stay here and we can, you know, the arts community here can thrive a little bit better. I feel like I have follow-up questions, but I don't want us to get too far down that rabbit hole because I know magic wand may not appear between now and then. So answer, yeah. <laughs> give us your answer and we'll see what uh, that brings up next. I'd like to see more, <laughs> more power being returned to the artists, um, you know, what happens a lot of the times is like we were, I spoke about distro kit earlier, you know, that did not exist maybe as five, 10 years mm -hmm. ago, you wanted to get your music on Spotify, iTunes, et cetera. That seems like a huge hurdle at first, but now it's m much more accessible. So if we keep moving in that, that direction, I, I would, I would like to think that it will be, it will be a lot easier to make, you know, music that um, can put food on the table because like she's speaking about, some of the most talented people I've met in my entire life have to make a choice at some point in time in their life of, do I want to perform for a few hundred dollars mm -hmm. three times a week, or do I want to give up? And in my, in my experience was say, recognizing within myself, okay, I, I have the skill set. how can I expand it? But if the tools aren't around, like if I'm in a recording studio that's $100,000, that's a huge hurdle to get over, but for the industry in the state we are right now, you know, a, a laptop and, um, and, a, and a microphone can get started like I was speaking about earlier. I'd like to think that if we continue on this trajectory, um, we could start building independent platforms for people because Spotify is paying you like a nano penny every time somebody, you know, and, and a lot of people don't recognize this, that the public is now the product. You as an artist are, you, you think that you're selling yourself to the public, but what's really taking place is something like Spotify is selling you mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to the, the public. They, they are either choosing to pay for the app or they're going to listen to commercials. And so that's really all at the time. And I know it's kind of a nihilistic view of things, but I think recognizing that we could realize maybe we could take the power back, build a better community, support, actually support people who are 
you know, not trying to make um, car commercial music. Do you think that that's like a national issue or is that in Oklahoma? I mean, I guess it would be both, but <clears throat> I, is that our major problem we're facing in Oklahoma? In, in Oklahoma, I feel like the, one of the, like, aside from a few venues that are like really great hangouts for groups of people, um, like you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Why, people don't care because they're so, you know, bombarded by just everything, you know? So if you want to have pride in your state, you could support your local musician or artist because the talent is not like, it's not just a national stage. There's, it's, it's right here. It's right in house. We can keep it in house. Okay, so we went to 2030. We're gonna come back a little bit and talk a little bit about COVID. I wanna go briefly. back to 2030. I know, I know, I do too. <laughs> but we gotta talk a little bit, I think, about like the recovery period because we're gonna have that, I think, a little bit. Um, you guys are already kind of experiencing it. So um, this is gonna be a hybrid question so that we get through it. I know we're getting short on time. Um, speak to maybe some of the job opportunities that are available um, and how they've had to pivot during the pandemic. So from like the, the broad marketplace to what that pivot looks like now and how those jobs are still functioning. And then also specific to your respective jobs, how are you sustaining in the middle of the pandemic? So we'll talk broad and then bring it back home to you. Um, it's very, very difficult. We've had to get crafty. And I think um, for you know a community of artists and musicians, luckily you're already artistic and you're already, your brain's already mm -hmm. out there. We've had to find ways to kind of you know, make it work. Everybody did the live stream thing and that sustained for a minute and then everybody got sick of it. And there's are still people that are doing it here, but they have established that that's like, you know, Hosties like Sunday night thing. And, you know, they've, you know, they've established that that's a series. And as far as the playing music aspect of it, the actual performing, um, performing aspect of it, it was literally live streams and then nothing. And then now people are starting to be like, we can't do this, we can't sustain. And people are getting creative about social distancing shows, like just played a show at the tower mm -hmm. um, where, you know, was, was that place, you know, a couple thousand people or however many it is, 200 tickets, all distance. Everybody wore masks from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, check in to sound check to the end of the night. And it, and it went really, really well. And so we're finding creative ways to do that now. But I don't, I don't think I have, unfortunately, an answer for what that looks like. I am open, so open, if anybody does have, you know, solutions to these problems. Um, but for a playing musician right now, unfortunately, it's, it's still really scary. And even as a graphic designer, my wheelhouse is concert posters and album artwork mm -hmm. and, you know, singles and stuff like that. And um, I have noticed the one way that a lot of the bigger bands that I do work for have been sustaining is they're doing singles. They're releasing singles, they're generating revenue, mm -hmm. they're getting royalties, mailbox money. And I've been able to sustain that way as well, just with the work that I had already put in, you know, in the last 15 or 20 years, those royalties that come in four times a month mm -hmm. or four times a year, excuse me, um, you know, kind of give us a little boost every now and then. But it's scary, especially for, you know, musicians starting out. I don't have, you know, I don't have an, the magic answer, unfortunately. Right. If somebody does, let me know. I've don't actually... stop, just don't be, don't get freaked out. Don't be scared, just yeah. keep going. Just keep trying, Some, throw it all against the wall, something will stick. <laughs> I've actually had a lot of work come in because people have nothing to do except sit in front of their computer right now. So that unfinished project, that film that kind of got put on the back burner, now they're suddenly needing a film score for. But that's really just been, you know, circumstantial. Um, what that looks like moving forward. I think that she kind of said it, said it very well, you know, um, it, it, is a, it is a lot of creative types and they're gonna come up with creative solutions, you know. Just yesterday, we um, I was involved with uh, two different groups, and basically we set up and filmed a live live band. You know, uh, so we've got the the engineer and, and the visual people, and, and I'm realizing that this is actually a a vehicle for something you could offer. Like, so if you wanted to offer a package to a band, you know, well, we can set you up and and, and film and put together the whole thing. You're you're going to have. Um, you know, a disaster is an opportunity at the same time. Right. And that's, I think that if I had one piece of advice, it would just be to remain optimistic um, because it's, you know, there, it, you don't have to know what it's, what it's going to look like to get started, to just start doing something. And last question, I mean, in the vein of remaining optimistic, tell us a little bit about um, what you have coming up next, where people can find you, whether that's your social media handles, um, we'll keep it light since we just, we just talked about the pandemic a little bit, but where can people find you and what do you have coming up next in the next six months to a year? 
Um, I will say that um, I've talked about my shop, Pigs Fly Shop, a lot, and that's where all of my projects lived for a while, my music thing. I do this really cool thing whenever I decide I'm going to quit music where I delete on my website and all my social medias, and then I have to start over again. <laughs> Um, I, so I, for the most part, started everything on a pigsflyshop.com and it has links now to my actual Ali Harder music website, to the nonprofits that I work for, the Rock Camp for Girls. Um, I work for a nonprofit uh, that supports single parents in Oklahoma City. So if anybody's struggling right now, hop on my websites, get a hold of me. Uh, there's resources for you out there. Um, I also do a radio show, uh, Sunday nights on the Spy, KOSU The Spy FM. There's links to that, which also has its own website. But pigsflyshop.com is going to be the hub okay. for all of these things. So if you're curious about any of them, it's a lot. I'm going to take up the rest of this video trying to explain all of them. Hop on there and all of that information is there. Readily available. Um, okay. Musically, I do have, um, randomly, uh, I did a, a song for the Oklahoma Humane Society, their Yule Log compilation that they do every year. I'll have a song on that, and then we are releasing a Christmas single, and this is the first time I've spoken about that. <laughs> okay, tell us, so is, is it a compilation, or is it just um, you? Well, the Oklahoma Humane Society, they put out a, a, compl a, a compilation um, called, it's the Yule Log, and they asked me to be a part of it this okay. year. And I had the song that I had written a million billion years ago and had a crappy demo for it. It's called White Trash Christmas Lights. Uh, <laughs> And I wanted to give it to them because I think it's a fantastic organization. And, you know, we, my, my kids and I adopted our, you know, fur family this year once we moved okay. into our forever home. And so it's very important for me to be a part of it. Went into the studio in Norman 115 and had a couple really fantastic musicians play on it. And it turned out so good, <laughs> not because of my performance, but because of the recording and what these musicians did on it. Um, I wanted it to be part of the catalog. And it's also, it's an important story for my family. So we're going to release it and it'll be um, out at the end of November, I believe, beginning of December. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I would just send people to my website, which is DustinEdwardHoward.com. Um, it's kind of the same thing. It's, it's a hub of, you know, if I... If I, I, I play in a rock band called Groucho, and we just released a new album, um, and that's doing really well. I'm very proud of that. It's just a three-song EP. Okay. Um, starting to get a lot of play and some some national you know radio organizations, and um, that's great. But I have maybe three or four short films that I've worked on um, that are all going to kind of start debuting um, over the next six months. I don't really want to try to name drop or anything, but sure. there's a lot of opportunities, and you can find a lot of that right on my website. Um, Another thing that's really, really um, I'm very proud of is uh, working for the um, the OCO series, the Cherokee Nation. Um, you know, I'm 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 really scoring for their their almanac, not all of them, but some of them right now, and that's opened up a lot of doors for me. I'm very proud to work with that um, with, with that organization. Okay, so we'll bookmark your website, so we'll keep checking back, mm -hmm. and follow you on social media. Easy right. game. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thanks this for having awesome. me. This was awesome. Nice to chat with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Graham, it's good to see you again. I know we worked together um, in the past, so it's nice to see you virtually today. I don't want to muck up your resume by going over it, so I'm going to have you um, introduce yourself a little bit and kind of tell us about um, your path specific to the business side. I know you have experience as an artist, and um, you know we'll, we can talk about that kind of interwoven throughout this conversation, but we're speaking to you specifically about business today. And I know you have your hands in a few different buckets. So if you can kind of tell us what you've got going on now. And um, I know you're at Jones Assembly, so maybe we can we can start there. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Graham Colton. I, I always have a difficult time uh, labeling sort of, am I a singer, songwriter? Am I an entrepreneur? Am I a venue owner? Um, and I guess I'm all of those things, I guess. I never know which uh, job description to put in front of the other. But, um, you know, my path um, to uh, the Jones Assembly, which is kind of currently um, my uh, most, I would say, uh, uh, inspiring uh, combination of everything uh, from music to uh, restaurant to food and beverage um, events, it all has, it all culminates here um, at this venue, which is a 20,000 capacity, I'm sorry, 20,000 square feet uh, venue where we do everything from 1,700 capacity concerts to large scale events 
to food and beverage, indoor, outdoor, upstairs, downstairs. Um, it's a crazy place, but it really is. Uh, it's been an inspiring spot to to kind of land after years as a touring artist and um, producer, songwriter. Um, so you know, it's life kind of sends you in a direction that you don't anticipate, and suddenly I'm on the business side. So that, that's my story. Well, I know you mentioned in your bio that returning home is kind of where you got your footing. Um, did you ever imagine being on the business side of things as much as you are, or were you expecting to be a musician, um, I guess, you know, for the rest of your um, industry experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Did I ever expect to be on the business side? No, I did not. Uh, I think any musician, um, or any artist for that matter, always uh starts starts out creating art creating in my case music um organically you're inspired and you want to express yourself um but something happens along the way at least it did for me um really starting this nearly 20 years ago um you just start to learn things and you make a lot of mistakes and um before you know it you are kind of in my case you're kind of running your own business you know you're sort of your your own ceo so, uh, again, I will say I have made a lot more mistakes than uh, have had success, but um, it really set me up for now having my own place and sort of applying all those, you know, those lessons learned to um, uh, a, a place of my own that, that is a lot of fun right now. So, um, you know, it's been something that has... Um, just provided me with a lot of inspiration because, you know, running my own business feels a lot like making an album. It's, it's, it's a very similar kind of muscle that you keep working. Um, and creativity is a part of my day every day, even though it's on the business side, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, um, you know, my next question kind of hinges on your experience as, um, as a musician and how that's led you to, I guess, maybe forward thinking a little bit with some of the collaborations with other studios, um, with bringing musicians into your venue, and primed you for what it takes behind the scenes to work with, you know, across the board from the from the marketing side to the right. um, artist relations side. Um, you guys have a massive operation over there and I know there's a lot of different <laughs> facets to it. So um, yeah. how has the music side, that transition kind of led you to where um, you're operating now with business? Yeah, I, that's a great question. So as I said before, I think for me and for the Jones Assembly, you know, um, I didn't anticipate being a, a business owner or an operator or a, a, a CEO or, or, or anything like that. Um, I have some great partners, some great operating partners. We have an amazing staff of 100 team members. Um, a lot goes on in this building um, with, with what we do inside here, which is the, you know, events, concerts, food, beverage. Um, but it really does feel very similar to making music, um, touring the, the cycle that I was so used to as an artist, um, over the last 20 years. And what I mean is that, you know, when you make an album, um, there's kind of a, 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 a ebb and flow of that process. You know, you have an idea to write a song and one song becomes two and two songs become four and suddenly you have a record and then you have to figure out sort of, well, how am I going to market that record? What feels right? Who are the people that need to be on my team to help me with that? Um, and then you send it out into the world and um, fortunately there's been you know you have success uh and you learn from your mistakes and running the jones assembly is very similar it's a very living breathing uh thing it's it's w what we do here there's an element of consistency which is similar as a touring musician you know you want to play a great show every night um even when you have challenges you know you break a guitar string or you sing the wrong lyric or no one shows up <laughs> you know um uh, and similarly here, you want to strive for consistency, but the cool part that is very reminiscent of being a touring and recording artist is when you, when you put on a big concert or you have these once every month kind of events, um, and you have to kind of go with your instinct and your gut on what's going to make that event special because none are the same. So we're very much like striving for consistency on one end and, um, 
I guess maybe fair to say inconsistency. Right. Inconsistency. So I was going to ask, is there a playbook? I mean, like, have you created a playbook internally? <laughs> Do you guys have like contingency plans and um, prepare for those things? <laughs> That's a really good question. Is there a playbook? Um, the playbook is ever changing, you know? Uh, and that's what I love about this place because, um, that I think is why so many musicians and artists get up every day is because there's no playbook. You know, you, especially now with technology, you know, that you can write a song, record it and push a button and your life could be forever changed. You know, being a songwriter place, uh, is similar in always changes, um, and there are always challenges that just when we think that we've seen it all with this place, there's a challenge that whether it's a huge artist that can't fit all their equipment onto our little stage and we have to make it work, or there's an event that has a very special request that is, you know, just crazy that we've never done in this space before, or it snows or it rains or, um, you know, even just simple things like that in a weird kind of way make this place a lot of fun. And it, it it's very reminiscent of, of being an artist and kind of rolling with the punches. And so specific to Oklahoma, how does um, the business that you're running there at Jones, how does Oklahoma kind of weave into that? I mean, storyline aside, I know the historic building, yeah. um, but what about Oklahoma makes Jones what it is? Yeah, um, Oklahoma and Oklahoma City and being from here, having moved away and moved back, um, timing is everything, right? So this place, Jones Assembly, would not be possible without just a number of things coming together at the right time. And one of the biggest things is just our city's renaissance uh, and our state's renaissance. Um, it, is, it is not ironic uh, or coincidental that... Um, this is happening right now. And there's so many great venues, um, new restaurants, people moving back to Oklahoma that have, uh, have, have returned or choosing to stay. You know, I mean, we are absolutely in, an, in an, uh, a cultural and artistic renaissance in our state. And the Jones Assembly kind of represents what's possible because before we built this place, there was, like you said, no playbook. No, nothing to really follow except a lot of little things that we pulled from really across the country and across the world that uh, uh, that we all just have kind of seen in our travels and we just put it all together under one roof. But it wouldn't be possible if our city and our state wasn't ready for it. So that was, um, we, we bet really big with this place and we dreamt really big. And um, fortunately, people have really... Uh, not only embraced it, but they have, they have inspired us to continue to do more and keep pushing programming on what's on what we can do with this place. Yeah. And so that high tide kind of rises all ships mentality. Yep. Um, so take, take Jones and where you are now, but think back to maybe some of the other venues that you research, some historical sort of um, different hidden treasures in the music world that maybe you've taken a little bit here and there from just um, over the over the years of establishing Jones to where it is now. Did you have any institutions that you looked to and said, I kind of want to be like this, or I want to get our marquee to look like this, or we want to have this yeah. facet of this so that it resonates with people? Yeah, that, that's also a really good question. And I think uh, I keep I keep giving these uh, uh, these instances where the Jones assembly is a lot like, like I said, making an album or writing a song or coming up with a music video. And, and it's all the same. I mean, anytime you create anything, um, I think that you're always pulling from inspiration from, from what you've seen and experienced in your life. And this place is not different. Um, so, uh, there was a lot of, um, you know, walking into this building that, which, which once was, uh, uh, you know, just a shell. I mean, it would have been a lot easier to just knock it down, but we would never have done that. Um, and so you walk into a space and you just look around and you get really inspired by what it could be. And yeah, your brain immediately goes to places that I've performed, restaurants that you've eaten in, um, bars that you visited, event spaces, um, even hotels uh, where you, you know, you put your hand on a doorknob, you know, everything from the smallest to the biggest decision um, we wanted to evoke a feeling and create an experience. Um, I can think of places like the Mercury Lounge in New York City, which is a really small 
little spot in Soho I used to play. Um, I was inspired by that little room, even though this place is 10 times bigger than that. You know, um, Stubbs Barbecue in Austin, Texas was a huge one for me because there was this great outdoor kind of built-in amphitheater component, um, which reminded me a lot of what we could do with our outdoor space. Um, a place called Foreign Cinema, which is not a music venue in San Francisco was another reference. Um, there's literally just small and large hundreds, if not thousands of places that you might not even know in your brain where it's coming from, but you always borrow inspiration, similar to how when you write a song. I mean, you, you know, I mean, every song I've ever written kind of reminds me of something and you pull things from that. And if you're not borrowing inspiration, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, inspiration came up in the other <laughs> panel a second ago. Yeah. So that seems yeah. like it rings true throughout. Right. Um, remind me, do you do any work with ACM? Or do you teach there? Or um, what's your relationship with ACM at UCO? I, I do not do any work directly with ACM, but uh, Scott Booker and co uh, have been just tremendous friends of ours for years. And we've been huge supporters uh, and allies of, of everything that they do. So, um, you know, just been thrilled to watch their success and growth. And again, another example of, of the tide rising all ships. I mean, that was just a huge step forward uh, for our city and our state. And on the business side, I mean, with the work that they do there at the school, can you give any instances of how maybe um, someone graduating from that school, getting that education there, what places they might have at Jones or in other facets of the music business industry? Um, if you can speak to that at all, because I know you don't, you don't teach there, but I know you know quite a bit about yeah. the industry at large. Right. Um, you know, I don't have any, uh, a, a ton of experience sort of knowing uh, where everybody has landed from, from ACM. Um, but I can tell you that uh, whenever I meet anybody, um, you know, locally that seems to have, have gone on to do things that are really making uh, impactful cultural changes in our city, there's always an ACM connection, mm -hmm. which is really, really cool. That's awesome. So a little bit about social media. I know you guys at Jones have everything kind of covered across all fronts and I follow all of them. Um, but is there any one in particular or um, any mix of the few that we have that exist now that, that Jones really thrives? Like what, what social media platforms work well for you and your business? Yeah, I think for social media, um, this place, the Jones Assembly is so visual that uh, Instagram is, is our number one driver. I, it's definitely our daily um, uh, vehicle that we use to, again, kind of like I said, to just keep things fresh. Um, the last thing we want to do here ever is feel like um, the experience is the same each time a guest walks into our building. And I know that's kind of weird, but that's a little bit of that balance like we talked about. Um, we of course want consistency when someone joins us for dinner or for drinks. But we want, uh, we want the experience to be different each time um, when someone's celebrating a birthday or when, you know, and then turns around to have Sunday brunch or then the next week shows up for a concert. You know, we want that experience to be different. So social media really helps us do that with allowing people sort of these different views of how each person um, experiences our business daily because it really is different even hour to hour you know and that's and that's something we really try and pull up we have an amazing social media team that is always thinking of new ways to sort of tell our story which is hard these days because everybody has great stories to tell and so how do you stand out and that's that's something that's really important to us yeah, well, we'll jump real quick. We've got about three, four minutes left. I want to jump to 2030 like I did with the other other panelists, and it kind of freaked <laughs> okay. everybody out a little bit. And in the, in the time that we have left, if you can tell me, um, you know, what do you see for the music business industry in general, uh, but then also at Jones, if you can kind of wrap that up for us. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID, so I know there's going to be a yep. little bit of a recovery period with COVID that maybe right. factors into what things look like in 10 years. But if you can wrap up in a nutshell for us, what the next 10 years look like, what it's gonna take to get there for what, where you want Jones and the music, where you expect the music business um, to yeah. go. And then right. if you wanna speak to COVID a little bit, you can too. Sure. Um, 10 years from now, um, I, I think that the possibilities are endless. I mean, four years ago, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have any of the venues 
um, well, I, sh I should restate that. Four years ago, we had um, far less venues than we do now, um, far less concerts than we do now. But what we did have is a great foundation. We had great venues, great promoters um, that really had helped move our state along for so many years. And um, venues like uh, you know, the Jones Assembly, uh, uh, Tower Theater, Douglas Auditorium, um, really are just standing on the shoulder of, of, of all the people that really started this scene for us. Um, so 10 years from now, I, I, I don't know how, how many more venues there'll be, uh, but I can tell you there's going to be a lot more musicians. There's going to be a lot more promoters. There's going to be a lot more photographers, graphic designers, people that want to be a part of this community. Um, and the fun part is to think about uh, how our market, our city, our state is going to be known. Because what I can tell you is that people are feeling the ripple effect of what our state is doing, which is really, really cool. Every agent manager that I talk to always says, what is going on in Oklahoma City? You know, not only are we doing more concerts, but uh, we're selling more tickets. Um, we're outperforming other cities. And that that is because, like we've said in this conversation before, the, the tide is rising all ships. Um, so I think there's just there's just a lot more to come, a lot more um, a lot more music, a lot more art, a lot more people choosing to come here. The quality of life is so great here. I, I think people are just realizing that this you know this state uh, and our cities are on the rise. You, I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID, but I will say I know you guys are, um, you've, you've adapted pretty well. I had my birthday brunch at Jones oh, thank um, you. and it thank was you. awesome. And I kind of got the feeling that you mentioned, like each time I can kind of, I can definitely relate to that feeling each time you go into Jones, um, whether it's a performance, which I've seen a few of or on, on the yeah. food side of things. So you guys do a great job and you've thank adapted you. during COVID. I can speak to the audience and say that since mm -hmm. we didn't get to touch on it. But thank you so much for your time today. It's good to see you. I'm glad you guys are thriving over there. I hear thank some you. hustle and bustle in the background, so <laughs> we won't hold you too much longer, but I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, it's good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for the Pivotal Work Early Access Series. I hope you've enjoyed the conversations today as much as I have. I've learned a lot, and uh, we hope to see you soon.